Well, a couple weeks ago, I was uh, flipping through the channels, and I came up on a TV show called Finding Bigfoot. Now, i got to be careful with this subject because I don't want anybody to get mad at me uh, here in Crossville, Tennessee. But as I watched this show, I was blown away at how the people that were attempting to find Bigfoot really, really, really believed that Bigfoot was out there. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Say amen. I mean, they believed that Bigfoot was out there, and so... I recognized when I got on the internet and just kind of did a little research on it that Bigfoot is actually like a really hot topic right now. There's a new movie out called The Missing Link that's about Bigfoot, and there's so many other shows that are about Bigfoot. Here's a, here's just some shows that they've made about Bigfoot that are pretty popular right now. Finding Bigfoot, Bigfoot Country, Killing Bigfoot, a show called Sightings, a show called In Search of Bigfoot, and then one called Mount monsters that dedicated two entire episodes to trying to figure out if Bigfoot was real, and then the greatest documentary that there's ever been on the existence to Bigfoot is, of course, Harry and the Hendersons, right, y'all? And so, so Bigfoot, what a legend, a legend of Bigfoot. A legend is defined as a traditional story sometimes popularly regarded as historical, but unauthenticated. Some more examples of a legend besides Bigfoot would be King Arthur and the Sword in the Stone. We all know that story. The city of Atlantis, we've heard it over and over. The Loch Ness Monster, this legend, it's never been authenticated, but it's a legend. Twilight, uh, Edward from Twilight, that's a legend. He doesn't exist. Amen, y'all. Amen, Amen, everybody with me? These are the jokes, people. Come on. And then we've even got legends that we kind of grow out of. There's legends that even we believe in at a certain age, but at some point we mature out of it. Hopefully everybody in here is going to know what I'm talking about, but Easter is one of those holidays where we have a legend of something that brings you a basket, and we've got another holiday in the year where somebody brings you presents, and at some point you mature out of it, and you go, well, that stuff's for kids. That stuff is just legend. It's just a myth. It's just fairy tales. Well, the shocking reality is, is that that's the way most people feel about Jesus, that he was a myth, and he was just a legend that's been unauthenticated. And more specifically, that's how most people feel about the resurrection of Jesus. In fact, they just did a study in the United Kingdom of people that claim to be Christians that are part of the church, and the majority of those people said, we don't even believe in the resurrection. The resurrection is what's known in the Christian faith as the linchpin of our faith. We base the entire weight of everything we believe on the resurrection of Jesus. If I could give you a rundown of Jesus' life according to the Gospels, this is what we believe here at Revolution. That there was a virgin who became pregnant and gave birth to this man named Jesus. He lived for about 33 and a half years. And somewhere around the time he was about 30 years old, he started an earthly ministry. In this ministry, for about three and a half years, he went around preaching and teaching and healing people. In the Gospels, it tells us all about his life. Eventually, Jesus would be accused falsely, would be scourged, and would be sentenced to crucifixion where he would ultimately die and then we believe resurrect from the dead and then eventually ascend into heaven. Most people, if you polled them today, even in Crossville, Tennessee, would say, that's a nice legend. That's a good myth. If you really dig down, they would say, that's a pretty good fairy tale. Even in the church, many of us question this. And so I'm going to challenge you this weekend. What is your faith in? Paul said in 
1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 17, listen to what Paul says about the resurrection and how everything we believe hinges on this resurrection, and it is the cornerstone of our faith. He says, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile because you are still in your sins. Paul says, if you don't believe in the resurrection, then why are you even sitting in here? What are you even doing here Easter weekend? Why are we even doing this thing called church? Because it all hinges on the resurrection. In Christianity, there are three great things that Jesus gave us. The first two you're going to recognize, but the third one is really where it starts. The first is known as what we call the great commandment. Everybody knows the great commandment in some form. We've got it on the back wall here because it's our mission statement here at Rev Church. And that's where Jesus said you're supposed to love God and love people with all your heart, soul, and mind. The second is called the Great Commission. And the Great Commission is where Jesus gave a mandate to his church to take the gospel and this story of the resurrection to people to give them an opportunity to experience God's grace and get to heaven. But the third that doesn't get as much playtime is known as the Great Question. Where in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus looked at his disciples and he asked a very simple question, but it gets pretty complicated. Who do you say that I am? What we hope to do this weekend at Rev Church is give you some facts and some evidence to help you come to a conclusion when you answer the question, who do you say Jesus is? We're investigating this weekend, and we're really looking to see, is there treasure in the Gospels? Like, is this true, or is it just a myth? We're kind of like the Goonies this weekend. Does that make sense, y'all? We're, we're looking for one-eyed Willie's treasure and hoping that it's real. Does that make sense? So, so everybody do this for me. Like, look at your neighbor and say, let's go find it, sloth. Go ahead. What's up, Sloth. Now look at your other neighbor and say, let's do this, chunk. You know what I mean? Like, That's the last of my 80s movie references, I promise. I want to start by just opening with this, what we can all agree on, no matter where you're at under the sound of my voice. Here's what every single one of us can all agree on. That no one in history's life or death has been more investigated, has been more studied, has been more analyzed, has been more debated, has been more scrutinized, and has been more heralded than the life and the death of Jesus. There have been more songs written about him by believers in him, and there have been more songs written about him by people who don't believe in him. There have been more books written by critics of him that did not believe in him than anyone else in history. And there have been more books written about him by people that believed in him than anyone else in history. Because of this, we've got a lot of information and a lot of facts that we can look at about the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. If I could try to help you understand why Christians believe what we believe when we read the Bible and we read about the life of Jesus, and we're getting to three questions here in a minute, I just want to preface it with this. It's because in the Bible you have two distinct areas. You've got the Old Testament and you've got the New Testament. And everything in the Old Testament was a picture of the New Testament that was to come. Specifically, in the Old Testament, it gave us a fingerprint for whoever the coming Messiah was going to be in the form of prophecies. A fingerprint is one of a kind. Every single person in here has fingerprints that cannot be duplicated. You have fingerprints that are one of a kind, and that's exactly what they did with the Old Testament. There were some 300 prophecies that the coming Messiah would have to fulfill in order to prove that they were the Messiah, or they would have to have the fingerprint of the Messiah. 
out of those 300 total prophecies, 61 of those are what we call major biblical prophecies that the coming Messiah would have to fulfill. Some people would say, well, whoever knew these prophecies really good could just fake these prophecies. But the majority of those especially major prophecies could never be faked. A person could never fake where they were born, the genealogy that they were born into. They could never fake the reaction of certain people, even specifically leaders like Pilate. They could never fake how they would die, where they would die, when they would die. A lot of these prophecies are ones that are impossible to duplicate. Uh, there was a man named Peter Stoner who wrote a book called Science Speaks. And he did the mathematical probability that anyone would fulfill just eight of these 61 major prophecies in their lifetime. And this is what he found. He found that the chances of one person just fulfilling eight of these 61 prophecies was one in 10 to the 17th power. To give you an idea visually of what that would look like, imagine that the entire state of Texas is filled with silver dollars of that number, 10 to the 17th power. If you did that to the state of Texas, that would mean it would be about two feet deep worth of silver dollars. Then imagine you take one of those silver dollars, you mark it and throw it in the middle of that pile, and then send a blind person into that pile to pick one silver dollar. The chances of someone fulfilling eight prophecies are the chances that that person would pick that one coin in two feet deep worth of silver dollars over the entire state of Texas. He goes on to summarize that for a person to fulfill not eight, but 48 of these prophecies that are found in the Old Testament, that it would be a one in 10, not to the 17th power, like with eight prophecies fulfilled, one in 10 to the hundred. 57th power. It's a fingerprint. And in Christianity, we want you to know we believe this lends credibility to the scriptures because the person that fulfilled every single one of these prophecies was, take a guess. Some of y'all are like, I don't know. Who is it? Jesus. Jesus fulfilled it. And so let's start with the simple question of can we rely on the Bible? Because you hear me talk about these prophecies, but can we rely, let's just stay in the realm of the Gospels. The Gospels, which are the biographies of Jesus that were written. And let's start with who wrote these four different Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John was a disciple of Jesus, and he wrote his depiction of what Jesus did in his lifetime some 65 to 70 years after Jesus died. It may sound like a lot of time, but just hold on because we're going to explain this. It's important to note that John was an actual eyewitness to every single one of the things that he wrote about that took place. If you move on and you look at Mark, who was also a disciple of Jesus, again, an eyewitness to the very things that he wrote about, he wrote his gospel somewhere around 30 to 40 years after Jesus passed away. Matthew, once again, a disciple of Jesus and an eyewitness to the things that actually took place that he wrote about, wrote his gospel somewhere around 50 years after Jesus passed away. And then we get to Luke. Luke was not an eyewitness. Luke wasn't a disciple of Jesus while he was here on earth. But if you read the book of Luke, it is probably the most detailed biography of Jesus. Why? Because Luke started out investigating Jesus' life. He was paid by a rich man. He was a physician that went and interviewed actual eyewitnesses to the things that Jesus did. 
He was uh, paid by a man to go interview Mary, the mother of Jesus, who was with Jesus almost every step of the way, to try to figure out what is different about this man, Jesus. In the process of this, like many others that have tried to do it since then, Lee Strobel, I read his book in preparation for this. Josh McDowell read his book in preparation for this. Again, trying to figure out and see if Jesus is legit or not, he becomes a Christian. It's important to note that of all four of the Gospels, that they are recognized as historical biographies by scholars. They were written extremely close to the events with eyewitness accounts and access to people that were eyewitnesses to the actual events that took place. And you may be thinking in your head, how in the world, like maybe the Bible's changed since then. Maybe somebody changed it. And I'm really glad you think like that because you're asking questions and questions are a good thing. This is what we know. We know that we have 5,686 manuscripts of the New Testament that were written within 100 years of the actual events that took place. 5,686 in Greek. We have over 10,000 manuscripts written about 100 years within the events that took place in Latin. And we have some 93 other early versions of the Bible that gives us a grand total of around 25,000 manuscripts written roughly within 100 years of the actual events that took place. Why is this significant? Because the second place getter in this, the thing that comes in second to the Gospels and the New Testament is a poem written about a war that is widely accepted as historically accurate in almost every university by a man named Homer, uh, and I believe how you pronounce it is Ziliad. There's some debate in our staff over how to say it, but it's Ziliad. And with Ziliad, who comes in second place, we have 643 manuscripts that were written within 400 years of the events that took place. The Gospels were written by and with testimony from eyewitnesses within 100 years of the events that took place. And we have over 5,000 accurate Greek manuscripts to support the writings. Those manuscripts that we have are 99.5% within uh, 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 exactly alike. The things that are different are not doctrinally different. It's like a paragraph splits here, or there's a comma here that's not in the other one where there is a comma. And so there's nothing that changes as far as doctrinally. And it's led most scholars to believe that the New Testament we have today and the Gospels specifically that we have today are 99.9% accurate to what they wrote to thousand years ago. In fact, in his book, uh, the author Dockery writes this, it must be said that the amount of time between the original composition and the next surviving manuscript is far less for the New Testament than any other work in Greek literature. I like what Paul Hovey said, and I pray that you would consider this and think about this. Men do not reject the Bible because it contradicts itself, but because it contradicts them. The Gospels are legitimate. That's not the question. And that's not where the rub comes in for most people. Where the rub comes in for most people is the fact that the Gospels don't just tell us about Jesus the man. They tell us about Jesus the Messiah. The issue that most people take with the Gospels are the things that Jesus did and the things that Jesus said. Because Jesus went around miraculously healing people, proving his deity, proving that he was in fact God. And he also, he also went around saying some stuff that sounded really crazy. Jesus said stuff like, I am God. No one can get to the Father except through me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. If you want to go to heaven, you have to come through me. Jesus even predicts his death 
his burial, and his resurrection. And that's where the issue comes with most people. Did Jesus resurrect from the dead? Well, let's answer a question before the question. Did Jesus really die? Did Jesus really die? Because we believe that Jesus was crucified, ultimately died, and was buried. This is what we know from the account in the Gospels that Jesus was taken to Pontius Pilate and Pontius Pilate ordered Jesus to be what we call scourged. A scourging was done with something called, I'm going to try to say this, a flagrum or a flagellum. We also call it a cat of nine tails that had a handle that was around 6 to 12 inches long. And it had 12 to 24 inch leather straps on it with pieces of, of uh, iron, with pieces of bone, with pieces of glass that would bruise and lacerate the person that was being scourged. One writer named Eusebius wrote this. He's a secular writer. This is what he wrote when he witnessed a scourging one time. Listen to what he said. Those standing around were struck with amazement at seeing them lacerate with the scourges to the very blood and arteries so that no flesh concealed in the very inmost parts of the body and the bowels themselves were exposed to view. So severe was scourging that the majority of the time, people didn't even survive the scourging. And if they did, they went into something medically that's known as hypovolemic shock. They're losing so much blood that their body freaks out and tries to hold on to all the fluids within their body. So their kidneys start to shut down, which, by the way, would make the person very thirsty, which lends credibility to why Jesus said he was thirsty on the cross. After this happens and Jesus' heartbeat is irregular as a result of the hypovolemic shock, he was sentenced to be crucified by Pontius Pilate where he was nailed to a cross with seven, inch, seven to nine inch nails that were driven through his wrists most likely because the Greek word, a lot of people you've probably heard before that if he put it through his hands it would rip if it put the weight on it. So one of two things, they either tied it with a rope and put it through his hands or the Greek word also includes the wrist. And so he had nails driven through his wrist, he had nails driven through his feet and he was hung on the cross. When people die on the cross, the majority of the time, the overwhelming majority of the time, the way they would pass away would be through suffocation. They couldn't breathe anymore. Because in order to get a breath, you would have to push off the very nails that were driven through your feet and driven through your hands to lift yourself up in order to get a breath. No question that as a result of this, Breathing would become more labored and would become less frequent, which would cause Jesus' blood to become more acidic. And that's important because when your blood acidity increases, it also makes your heart beat rapidly. Remember, his heart was already beating rapidly and irregularly because of the hypovolemic shock. As a result of this, follow me, y'all with me? Say, I am. As a result of this, this would cause water and moisture to gather around the membranes that would surround his heart and lungs. After Jesus goes through all this, don't, don't forget that, after Jesus goes through all this is the point where the professional executor takes a spear and stabs him in the side, puncturing his heart and the membrane surrounding his heart, if not the lung. One doctor actually did a study on what it would take in order for blood and water to flow out of a person that had been stabbed in the heart like the gospel accounts give us. And he is quoted as saying that crucifixion lends the perfect circumstances for someone to have blood and water flow out of their heart instead of just blood because of the moisture that gathers around their membranes. Very important to note that this professional executor who did this for a living, that if he failed at his job, he would be executed himself, recognized that Jesus was dead. I don't think we can debate whether or not the Gospels are reliable or whether or not Jesus died. 
the more debatable question is, did Jesus resurrect from the dead? That's the money shot right there. Did Jesus resurrect from the dead? Let's look at just a few facts. We're just hitting like a pin drop of this stuff. I want to tell you this, that everything we believe hinges around that phrase, on the third day he rose. That's why this question is so important and it creates so much friction. I also want to tell you that there is a major difference between resuscitation and resurrection. Resuscitation would be a great example of that would be like when Jesus, uh, uh, Lazarus, raised from the dead. He had the same body he had here on earth. It wasn't a new one. Resurrection, the Bible makes very clear that the only two things we know that Jesus showed from the crucifixion because of the account of Thomas who said, I'm not going to believe unless I can see the nail-scarred hands were the nail-scarred hands and the spear in his side. And this is, this is why you're going to know after I explain a couple of these theories that there is. When it comes to did Jesus really resurrect from the dead, the first theory that a lot of people would kind of go to, probably the most popular theory, is what's called the swoon theory. It caused you to think these thoughts that are in the swoon theory. The swoon theory suggests that Jesus just went into a coma or he just passed out. It ignores all the facts that we just talked about with the question, did Jesus really die? And it assumes that Jesus survived the scourging and the crucifixion. And somewhere around 36 hours after that, Jesus recovered enough in the tomb from his wounds to remove a 3,000 to 5,000 pound stone that had been rolled in front of the grave that he was in. He then had enough strength in his in his weakened state to be able to A, overpower the Roman guards, which there was at least two of, overpower the Roman guards that were in charge of guarding him, or he harbored a deal with them. Oh, by the way, if the Roman guards let anything happen to Jesus' body, they would be executed. So he made a deal with them somehow for them to let him go. After he gets past the guards, he's naked. He has flesh hanging off of his body. Remember, bowels most likely even exposed. He walks some seven miles to a town called Emmaus with two witnesses that didn't recognize who he was the entire walk. Seven miles in his state. After this, he convinces his disciples that he's good. I'm good. I'm good. Y'all good? Y'all good? Y'all good? Everybody look at your neighbor and say, you good? You good? You good? Look at your other neighbor and say, I'm good. I'm good. Hey, I'm good, guys. I know my bowels are out here. I know my flesh is hanging off my body. I know uh, I can't hardly stand up or walk or anything, but I'm good. I'm good. Yep, I'm good. Guys, I'm good. I'll just walk seven miles. I'm good to go. And he would convince them that he was good. If you want to believe the swoon theory, you can go ahead. I've just explained it to you. Just take the facts. Just look at the evidence. The next theory that's the most popular probably is what's called the stolen body theory. Stolen body theory suggests that someone stole the body of Jesus, which is why it disappeared. Again, it ignores the facts that I just, I'm not going to repeat them in the swoon theory that whoever stole the body, which most likely would have been the disciples, right? Because they were the people that were closest to him, would overpower the guards, move this, this uh, uh, tons, tons of weight stone that was in front of this grave and be able to take Jesus' body without being detected. But probably the greatest evidence we have against this theory is the behavior of the disciples, See, one of the ways we know that the Bible is true is because within the Gospels, it contains what we know as embarrassing testimony. 
uh, we wrote, the Gospels not only include talk about Jesus, but it also talks about the forefathers of our faith. It talks about Peter. It talks about John. It talks about all these people. And if you read through the Gospels, you see that in certain places, it's not very flattering to the forefathers of our faith. It makes them look like fools. In fact, when Jesus is arrested, what did the disciples do? Anybody know? Took off and ran. Anybody remember Somebody denied Jesus three times and even cussed when they did it while Jesus was on trial. This embarrassing testimony is one of the ways that we know the Gospels are real because if they were made up, why would it not paint the disciples in a really, really good light? But more importantly, it doesn't explain their behavior. Because see, before Jesus resurrected, the disciples are pictured as a group of wimps running away, denying Jesus, scared to death. Something happens, though, because eventually these men that were wimps become warriors. Eventually, every single one of the disciples are taking the message of the gospel and the message of the resurrection of Jesus all over the world, and they are being killed for their faith. Something happened within that time frame that made them believe like they've never believed before because if you study about the disciples, you will find that every single one of them were martyred. That's our word for they were killed for spreading the resurrection story. The third theory and I'll be done real soon. Y'all good? Say, I am. We've been to class this weekend, right? Y'all good? Say, amen. Are y'all, y'all, y'all are smart, aren't you? Like, I know, I know, there's not a lot of funny jokes this weekend, but y'all are good. You got Google on your phone. You can handle this. Amen, y'all. Like, third theory that is probably the most popular to debunk the resurrection of Jesus would be what's known as the hallucination theory. Somebody asked us last night if we had hallucinogens in the fog that we did before, before I got up here to preach. No, we didn't. Make for a fun Easter service, though, wouldn't it? So. The hallucination theory suggests this, that the disciples, and oh, by the way, the over 500 eyewitnesses to Jesus' resurrection that identified him and identified his resurrection, that these over 500 people all had a dream or hallucinated Jesus resurrecting from the dead. In basic psychology, it's well known that dreams and even hallucinations are individual and personal They are not corporate. The greatest evidence we have to debunk this is for over 500 people to have this hallucination or this dream makes absolutely no sense. Even the enemies of Christianity recognize, even if you read some secular writings, they recognized something has happened at the tomb of Jesus because his body is not here any more. At some point, at some point, now I've just given you like a little, a little flavor of some of the facts, okay, y'all? I've explained just a few theories to you. At some point, when you do the Ben Franklin method at looking at the evidence and the facts of Jesus' resurrection and his life, where you take the facts for it and put it on this side, and you take the facts against it and put it on this side, at some point you have to recognize that overwhelmingly the evidence and the facts that we have support the gospel account of Jesus' resurrection. I would take this even a step further and say at some point when you really know what you're talking about, and you really study this, and you investigate it on your own, at some point, it takes more faith to not believe in the resurrection of Jesus than it does to simply believe in his resurrection. I'll take that a step further, and I will challenge you with this this weekend. If Jesus did, in fact, resurrect from the dead, 
if you come to the conclusion based off the evidence and the facts that Jesus did in fact resurrect from the dead, then you have to admit that he is completely different than any other human being that has ever walked this planet. And you cannot explain away the facts. You cannot ignore this man Jesus based off of the facts. You have to wrestle with the great question that Jesus posed to every single one of us. Who do you say that I am? Every major religion around the world has had to answer the question of who they say Jesus is. Individually, every single one of us has to answer this question, who do you say Jesus is? Get the lights, guys. And I'm going to leave you with two quotes and a scripture. I really plead with you during this scripture. I'm trying not to be real preachy this weekend. I'm trying not to make this just emotionalism and a pep rally to try to get people stirred up to raise your hand at an altar call or something like this. I'm really trying to be sober in this and just give you facts. Obviously, I have a bend and I have a lean towards this. I'm a preacher. Woohoo! wake up. That's me, okay? So, so I know by saying it, I sound sarcastic at times, but I'm really wanting you to just look at the facts. Listen to these two quotes, though. John Stott wrote this. I, wrote, I read one of his books in the last few weeks. The chief reason people do not know God is not because he hides from them, but because they hide from him. Rabbi Zacharias, Zacharias uh, he's got a great book. I think it's called Why Jesus. It's great. He's one of my favorite speakers. He goes around to college campuses speaking on this subject of apologetics and the facts, just the facts, just the evidence. Listen to what he said. Let this sink in, y'all, just, just, just for a moment. Give me a moment, guys, and just let this sink in. A man rejects God neither because of intellectual demands nor because of the scarcity of evidence. A man rejects God because of a moral resistance that refuses to admit his need for God. It's not because we don't have evidence. It's not because you're just, you know, you got to have all the questions answered. I just, I, I don't have enough faith to believe that stuff. Well, when you look at the facts, when you actually study it, what do you have enough faith to believe in? Rabbi Zacharias says, no, you're, you're, you're rejecting it because you're rejecting out of pride your need for God. The book of Isaiah, chapter 1, verse 18, we're going to put that up on the screen. I want to read this to you. Y'all leave that up while I'm talking about it too, please. God is speaking to Isaiah, and this is a picture of the coming Messiah. This, this scripture is a picture of the coming Messiah. Um, <laughs> I love this scripture because it talks about how your sin will be as white as snow. I remember I did a, a sermon on Snow White and used this scripture, so it's probably pretty recognizable to you guys that are in church a lot, but this is what God said to Isaiah. Come now, let us reason together. Everybody say reason together. One, two, three. Reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. He's saying in that last part, the coming Messiah is going to take all those mess-ups and all those sins and if you put your trust in the Messiah, you're not going to have to worry about him anymore because they're as white as snow. But I love what he says at the beginning of this scripture. And this is my heartbeat for every single person under the sound of my voice this weekend at Rev Church. He looks at Isaiah and says, come, let us reason together. What that means in the Hebrew is, let, let's use our intellect. Think this through right now. Get outside your past experiences and your stubbornness and what you think you believe and, and you know how it is and blah, blah, blah. And for a moment, let's just reason together, guys. Let's just reason together. Like, like just think this through for a moment. What he's saying is, you're messed up. 
Come on, man. You're messed up. You, 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 you've, you've dropped the ball. I love hearing those kids screaming, don't y'all? You've dropped the ball. And it's ugly. Your mess ups are ugly. Nobody even knows all the things that you've done. Nobody even knows all the things that you've thought. That's how ugly they are. You've hit them. They're, they're scarlet. You know that. Let's, let's reason for a second. You know you're messed up. You know you can't get it right. You know you've promised yourself or you've promised God, I'm never going to do it again. And then within, within a year, within a month, within a week, within a day, within the hour, you've done the exact same thing that you promised you would never do. It's ugly, man. It's red like crimson. And let's just let's, let's, let's use our brain here. We know that's true about ourselves. Every one of us individually knows this. What God's saying is there's coming one that's going to fulfill all those prophecies. There's coming one that's going to become that ugliness for you, and he's going to die. And then he's going to resurrect from the dead, defeating death, so that you can be made white as snow so that you don't have to be separated from God, so that you can be fulfilled, so that you don't have to be wore out all the time. You can know what it's like to experience true rest in your life, so that you can, maybe even you got all the things that the world says, that's what you need to be happy and be joyful and and be fulfilled. No, you figured out that's not enough, man. There's still something missing. I'm not sure what it is. I still feel ugly. The Messiah is going to come. He's going to clean that ugly off of you if you'll put your trust in him. Could it be, listen to me, hear me. I know I'm going long. Y'all are big big girls and boys, though. You can hang in there. Amen, y'all. Y'all with me? Say amen. Could it be that you are here this weekend for this moment? Could it be that, look, this ain't ain't about, you know, the big church weekend, Easter. You know, this, this is about God coming in contact with people that walk through these doors and you don't know him. You walk through these doors questioning everything about him. You walk through these doors and and you've been away for a long time doing your own thing, not doing God's thing for you. Could it be the reason you're here right now is because God is whispering in your ear and he's saying, Let's reason together here. Let's reason together. I love you. I love you. I'm here for you. Could it be that you came on the weekend to hear a really weird Easter sermon because you've had all the exact same questions that we just answered and that's what's kept you from God? Could it be that the one that created you is calling you home? He's calling you home. This is what we're going to do. I'm going to lead a prayer. And as I say this prayer, if that's you, if you need Jesus, if God is calling you out in this moment, I want you to repeat this prayer. You can say it in your mind. You can say it out loud. We don't care if you say it out loud. This moment, I'm not going to have anybody come up front and give a testimony or stand up or anything like that. We're not going to have you do anything embarrassing. But we're going to give you the opportunity to come home if God's calling you home. Every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around. Lord, there are people right here, right now, under the sound of my voice, that you are calling home. 
You're not calling them to go to church. You're not calling them to be religious. You're not calling them to just put scriptures on their Facebook page so that everybody will think they're holy. You're calling them to yourself. You're not calling them to dead religion. You're calling them to life. And so right now, God, I pray for every single person under the sound of my voice that they don't need a one-liner from me. They need to hear from you, God. There are people in here that have never known you. And right now in this moment, it's so hard for them even right now to pay attention. It's so hard for them right now to break their pride and admit their need for you. But God, I pray that in this coming moment, people under the sound of my voice would break and you would minister to them. If you need Jesus, I'm going to say this prayer. Nobody looking around. Repeat it after me. I'm probably going to go pretty fast. You may want to do it in your mind. And please, by all means, put it in your own words. You don't have to say it exactly like I say it. God knows exactly where you're at and exactly what you mean. Just say, Lord, I need you and I am broken and I am messed up. I have dropped the ball. And I recognize right now in this moment that I need you. I don't have all the answers to all the questions, but God, I don't need them because right now I'm stepping out on faith and putting my trust in you. I don't want to do things my way anymore. I want to do things your way. Help me become the person that you want me to be, God. I come to you right now and just ask you, would you save me? I put my trust in you. I give my life to you. I give everything to you, Jesus. Lord, I pray for the people that just prayed this prayer. I believe they're in this room. God, I pray that this wouldn't just be another Easter service full of emotional content where they say some prayer that doesn't mean jack squat. I pray, God, that people in this moment are truly coming to know you, truly rededicating their lives to you. I pray that people are going from death to life. They're not just trying to be good, but they are believing in the resurrection of Jesus. We love you. You are awesome, and you are mighty. In Jesus' name, everybody said, God been good today, y'all. Come on, man. God been good. We are so glad that you've joined us online today and checked out Revolution Church. You can find us on Facebook and actually go like our page if you want to keep up with the church, or you can join our text club, text Rev Church to 62582. If you have questions, if you'd like to talk to someone, if you have prayer requests, just email us at office at crossvillerevolution.com or you can call our church at 931-248-6441. Thank you so much.